Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Kane Audio vlog. It's Friday morning, so it's time for another AMA. As usual, if you're new to this channel or new to this AMA series, uh, you, if you've got a question for me, then drop it as a comment below this video here and I'll get to it next Friday. Uh, before I get started, house admin. Uh, as usual, I kind of, on a Friday morning, set up the camera and just hit record and I haven't really thought through what I'm doing. Mm, in terms of what I have been doing, I've been working on an effects pack. I'll talk more about that later. Uh, I've also been doing some TV documentary music stuff. Again, I'll talk more about that when it's in a later stage. Uh, upcoming, I've got a gig in Nosdoc Festival in Hereford in two weeks time, I think. So I'm kind of getting to the point where I probably need to start prepping for that show. Uh, I think that's probably it. There's nothing major to mention in house. Uh, so I'm going to crack straight on. Uh, I've loaded up the comments here from last week's video, starting with Casey Music. Hey Dom, uh, speaking about mix downs, how about taking a track from one of your listeners, like showing what's crap in our projects? I think hardly anyone needs a permission from a label around here, and it would be very helpful. There is probably too much to do it in one video, but this is an option. Um, yes, I'll probably do one at some point where I take on a listener's project, but when it comes to permission from labels, I still need permission from labels because if it gets signed to a label, then they own the copyright, uh, not you. Um, so they own the master copyright anyway, uh, because that's what getting signed to a label is. Um, so unless it's your own label, then maybe that's a bit different. And then the other thing is, like I've mentioned before, um, or in fact, something I probably haven't mentioned is a lot of labels use uh, companies that that serve takedown notices of, you know, pirate websites and whatever. And they, they scan, so they set up bots to hunt for your music on pirate sites. And obviously, if it's there, then they serve a takedown notice and get it deleted. Um, a lot of those are automated bots, so sometimes if you upload something on YouTube and it's copyrighted material by a label that uses one of those companies, it just gets served a notice and taken down and then you have to dispute it and it gets a pain in the ass. Uh, so it's not impossible, but uh, I have spoken to a couple of artists already, so and they're sort of regular clients, that, I, and I'm, like I said before, I'm kind of waiting for a, for a track that has not too much wrong with it, but enough subtle tweaks to uh, to make the video a bit more interesting and a bit more useful, I suppose. Um, secondly, how do you get your drum sessions full enough? I regularly have the problem that the drum session itself sounds kind of empty, but every percussion element added to the mix sounds strange and not very fitting. Is there a solution for exciting the elements already existing in your mix without adding new ones? So your drum, you're saying your drums sound too empty and you add more percussion in to try and fill them out a bit. Uh, sometimes that might be just down to the mixed levels of your drums. Um, I, if you think of a, a, a track as a whole, you have your main focus elements. Those are usually your, your lead line synth, your bass line, your kick drum, your snares, claps, maybe hi-hats, certainly for me, hi-hats are a focus point. Um, and those are really, so you'll have maybe a couple of subtle little melodies under the background. You might have an arpeggiator running through. You could have some sweeping effects and bits and pieces. It's all, they're all sort of adding to the dynamics. But if you think of them in terms of mix levels, those added parts are really just subtly in the background. What they're doing, um, if you were to visualize it, you, what those parts are doing are just holding up the rest of the track. You know, something like a sweeping effects would, uh, is, is almost carrying your main lead melody It's saying, look, here's the big melody. And, and, um, I think when it comes to your drums, that's, 
quite similar as well where you've got your your focus points would be your kicks your claps your snares whatever and then your percussive elements are really just sort of propping up the drums however if you listen to some of my tracks for example you'll notice what i'll do is maybe every four bars there'll be a tom drum hit or fill or something that's maybe a bit off kilter um and that tends to be a bit higher in the mix than i would normally have a tom drum if i had a, a rolling tom drum or a, a tom rhythm throughout the whole four bar loop or whatever then i'd bring that quite i don't even know why that stopped recording but i'm pretty sure i caught it at the right time so I haven't cut out too much uh, dodgy camera um, so I was saying uh, if I have a, a tom drum rhythm throughout a, a drum loop then uh, I'll usually have that quite low down in the mix because it's just adding a bit more detail it's just adding a bit of extra something um, whereas if you'll notice with a lot of my more recent tracks over the last couple of years I'll have more of a focus point on a tom drum hit or some sort of snappy percussive sound it might be slightly off rhythm so it might be on the second sixteenth of a beat um, and I'll make that a focus point so I think that's probably something to think about when you're when you're putting together your drum sounds and you're making that drum loop and, and getting the groove going uh, I think sometimes maybe think about what's the focus of the drums what 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 do the drums need to achieve are they just going to be straight kicks and claps and not much else because the rest of the track does the work or is it a fairly stripped back track and in which case do you need to add in some rolling percussion that keeps the momentum and the groove going or do you need to have those drums uh, and, and if that's the case, if they're more of a rolling thing to just prop it up and keep the groove, then they can be somewhat low down in the mix. But if you're making it a, a key focus point of the track, uh, like I quite often do, then bring it slightly up in the mix. Um, and it just brings a bit more focus and attention. And sometimes I'll, I'll have some of my percussion is almost as loud as the kicks, uh, if not sometimes a bit louder on the transients. Um, just so they really cut through and they, they shine a bit. Um, when you do that, however, another thing, and this is probably a second sort of tip for mixing drums, is uh, pay careful attention to the length of drum sounds. If you've got a rolling tom drum, for example, then cut it short, make it really short and snappy. Um, if, you've, if you're using something like Exfer Nerve or a drum machine or a sample-based pattern that you can control the ADSR values of each sound um, even with a hi-hat if it's in sixteenths just grab the sustain and bring the sustain down and then grab the decay and start with maximum so it doesn't change the sound and just slowly dial it down and, and shorten the sound and you'll notice at, at a certain point it just sounds good um, just keep playing with that decay uh, dial on something like a tom drum or any kind of rolling rhythmic groove sounds uh, keep playing with that decay because sometimes you'll find that a tom drum is just a bit too long or or, or even just a bit too short um, I think that's probably a good thing to do third tip high pass and low pass filters I can't stress how important they are if you've got a high tom drum you'd be surprised by how much low frequency energy is being used in there so if it's a high tom drum stick a high pass filter on there um, and just scoop from 20 hertz start scooping up while it's playing and just to the point where you can just start hearing not when it's soloed but when it's playing with the whole track um, just start scooping that high pass filter frequency up and just to the point where you can start hearing oh it's made made a big difference to that sound and then dial it back a little bit so it doesn't make much difference um, and if you do that to various uh, channels within the track you'd be surprised how much sort of space you can open up um, and that's when you can start looking at things like maybe maybe a little bit of reverb or something um, 
again with drums I don't tend to use much reverb unless it's a one-off hit at the end of say four bar loop or eight bar loop or whatever um, and if you are going to use reverb you just make sure it's a tiny amount because I think for me personally and I, you know it's subjective but for me personally I think um, reverb on drums unless you're going for that 80s synthwave style thing then reverb on drums are, are kind of overkill uh, especially in modern dance music uh, so hopefully that answers your question um well and manchester high five uh then kavoke has replied to you saying funny you should mention drum sounds i was just watching the following video earlier might be a little helpful different genre perhaps but some of the points are made universal uh and then uh you've linked a video sorry i keep banging on about this guy uh, but i've learned loads from his vids oh this is the guy you've mentioned last week do you know what i still haven't mentioned uh still haven't looked at his video so what i'm gonna do oh 10, hang on right where was it uh replies open a new tab right it's in the background so i'm gonna look at that uh, P.S. Sorry, I keep banging around back there. Right, I've read that bit. Casey Music. Uh, first of all, thanks for the answer. Pretty great vid. Uh, though it's for live drums, you can definitely transfer some tips and tricks into electronic genres. Uh, for me, some sort of melodic techno. Uh, I'm already pretty good in finding the right kind of drum and drum bus compression. The sounds I have in my grooves are pretty much the way I want them. Still, I'm lacking some groovy elements and I don't know which, because all new elements I try sound wrong. Uh, Okay, yeah, so I don't think that is something I can answer. Uh, John Bloomfield, Manchester, high five. Uh, hi, Dom, when you were producing part-time whilst working, how did you motivate yourself to go into the studio? So, I don't think I needed to motivate myself. I mean, um, when I had a day job, I, I, I would just get back home and turn the computer on and start doing it I don't think I needed to force myself ever um, oddly enough I think I probably have to force myself more now than I did back then um, but even still I mean I love my job and I love nerding out with computers and and don't get me wrong I can find myself every now and then I say every now and then more than I'd like to admit um, I find myself down a rabbit hole of YouTube videos or Facebook posts or whatever but I think we all do that I think I think probably most people with a nine to five job spend more time on Facebook than they'd like to admit um, as for motivating yourself do you know what I, I think well what once you're full-time in music and you've made that commitment to become self-employed uh, the motivation is hunger uh, metaphorically and physically uh you know metaphorically you're hungry for more work you're you're hungry to become somewhat of a success um but physically you're actually hungry and you need you know you got to pay bills and you got to eat so uh i think that was a huge motivation for me back back then uh cav okay Dom, welcome to Manchester. Thank you. Uh, although it's a few years since I moved away, but welcome anyway. I half expected you to be moving to Berlin as everyone and their dog seems to be relocating there these days. Yeah, we went through a phase a few years ago where everyone I knew was moving to LA. Uh, that seemed to last all of about a year. Um, and then pretty much all of those people have now moved somewhere else. And yeah, it does seem like a lot of people are going to Berlin these days. Um... I can understand it though. Um, Berlin's a great city um, and it's a good culture there. There's a good work culture as well. Uh, question uh, Would it be useful to have a track from this community to work with your mixed down tutorial? I've been planning to approach you about the mixed down service advertised on the Kane Audio site at some point. Not immediately, as I'm not happy with any of the options I currently have for a suitable track. Um, we've also had a couple of lean months, so paying rent is first priority right now. Absolutely, paying rent should always be priority. Um, simple as that. Um, not immediately. There's no rush. Um, so I kind of, I think I've probably already answered it at the beginning of the video about using uh, 
one of the viewers tracks on a mix down tutorial um, by all means if any of you guys get in touch with me and you want a mix down done and you know you've seen the prices on the Kane Audio website and whatever and you're happy with all of that then by all means let me know if you if you want it featured and you know we can at least start talking about that uh case your music's point applies i.e no permission from label needed and you'd already have permission from the artist but it would obviously need to be a track of engage uh, engaging you in a professional capacity as i say uh not something i can do right now but perhaps an idea to consider if it works with your plans and time scale for the tutorial yes uh so yeah i i think i've already covered that one now um it's definitely an option i'm happy to consider uh, Med, hey Dom, any tips on arrangement of a track and how to learn it quickly? So first of all, I would say never learn anything quickly. It shouldn't be quick. If it's quick, then you're not really learning. Um, however, uh, tips on arrangement of a track. You know, this is one of those things that, that so many people seem to struggle with arrangement of a track and I'm not sure what that is but for some reason I don't I never really feel bad about my arrangements I don't know if they're good for all I know my arrangements could be shit but I've never really stopped to consider it too much maybe if I'm doing a radio edit um, I just tend to listen to the track and tell yourself I've never heard this track before at what point does it become boring? And I tell you what, one of the best ways of doing that is showing a friend. Play it to your mum, your dog, your friend. Uh, someone who's maybe not even into that kind of music. And you sit there watching them listen to it. And I find when I do that, uh, what I tend to find is... is it gets to a point where I'm like, oh, this bit's gone on a bit long. I think they're getting bored. And that's telling me that I need to change the arrangement up a bit there. Um, and you kind of just without they don't even need to say anything. They could, you know, you could finish the track and they go, that's the best thing I've ever heard. But you'll know in your head that there were a few moments where you felt you wanted to skip a bit. And if you want to skip a bit, then there's probably a reason for that. So that's tip number one. Uh, second of all, I think arrangements are something that we can probably quite safely steal. And by that, I mean, find a similar sounding track where you think this is great. This doesn't ever get boring. This track, I can listen to this track on loop all day. Um, find one of those tracks and drag it into your workstation. Uh, if you're using Bitwig or Ableton, whatever, drag it into the top channel and warp it so it's in time and mute that channel. Don't listen to it, but you can see, right, there's the breakdown, there's the drop, there's the middle eight, whatever it is you're looking at. Um, and maybe rearrange your track to sort of suit a similar thing. So if, for example the track you've chosen has you know 16 bars somewhere in the middle where the bass gets cut out of the kicks and the bass or something like that and then it comes back in uh, you know obviously don't copy it completely so don't use that taking away the bass but maybe take away the kicks altogether and use that as a breakdown element or something um, I do it myself certainly for radio edits there are a few tracks where I think that is a standout arrangement because you can clearly spot the verse, the chorus, the middle eight, the the intro, the outro, whatever the elements are. And you just sort of think every 15 seconds there's this new layer of this track happening and I'm loving it. Um, so I'll quite often, you know, it could be a pop song, even though my track won't be a pop song necessarily. But I can drag in a pop, pop song that's say two and a half minutes long or whatever. And I want to do a radio edit of same similar length and I'll literally just sort of I'll chop up that top track and I'll color code it because I'm a nerd. So I'll start with yellow uh, for intro, then orange for uh, a verse and then red for a chorus or something like that uh, and maybe green for a breakdown and I'll chop it up into sections and I'll color code it so I can see exactly where the verse and the chorus is um, and then I'll grab my track 
And even though my track um, might not have a verse and a chorus, there are bits I can call a verse maybe where there's no lead line and a bit I could call a chorus where the top line melody is at its maximum. Um, so I'll kind of cut my track up and then sort of match by colour coding and you're almost painting by numbers. It's it's uh, it's almost cheating. It's so easy. But I, I think that's probably if you want to learn quickly, that's probably a good way of doing it, especially when it comes to doing like a radio edit, something like that. Uh, so there we go. Moving on. Sunset 86. Hey, Dom. Uh, they say it's the capital of the north. They do. Uh, great AMA as always. And uh, definitely buy a Kane audio book. Awesome. Uh, so my only real question this week is when submitting stems to you as a mix engineer, as well as submitting in the correct format, etc. Uh, do you prefer a wet stems and dry stems folder? E.g. should the client have stems with an effect they really want uh, so you can either use their wet affected stem uh, or use it to recreate the same kind of sound or do you just prefer one folder of all stems dry then communicate with the client about what sound they want in terms of effects etc. Uh, hope that question wasn't too vague. It wasn't and that, that's a really good question actually because a lot of people ask that when they're getting a mix down for the first time. So I can't speak on behalf of other mix engineers necessarily but pretty much all the ones I know of work in the same way as me um, believe it or not it's the opposite of that we want wet if you've put reverb on a snare drum leave the reverb on the snare drum if you've put a chorus effect on a bass line then leave it there because what I want to do in an ideal world is because those decisions are subjective. They're down to you as the artist. If you've put reverb on a snare drum, you've chosen to do that because you wanted a reverby snare drum. So if you gave me a dry snare drum, I'm not going to be able to know, did he want a dry snare drum or a wet snare drum? I don't know what you wanted it to sound like creatively. So, so in an ideal world, I want to be able to receive all your stems that are all the exact same length, the exact same tempo, everything's exactly as you left it, all the effects are left in there and I want to be able to drag and drop all of those stems into a project file on my end and I want to be able to hear exactly what you heard before you sent it off. Um, because that's you, it's up to you to get your track it's done it again for some reason. Um, I'm guessing it's probably overheating in this heat wave. Um, what was I saying? Yeah, it's up to you as an artist to get your trackers as far as you possibly can to the best you can get it and then let the mix engineer take it from there and raise it another level. So it would be silly to for you to get your track as far as you can and then take off all the effects and send it to me and then me have to redo the whole thing. Um, because I won't know what you wanted. So you've kind of said sending wet and dry. That's an option, but probably a waste of time when when you've probably already done a pretty good job. And if, for example, I wanted to remove the reverb uh, from, let's say, a snare drum, then I, I'd just email you and go, actually, I don't like that reverb. Can you send me it dry, that snare dry, so I can add my own reverb or do whatever? Uh, but even still, usually when it's something like, let's say, reverb on a snare drum, if I'm honest, there's usually ways of removing it as a mix engineer. You can shape it, control it. Um, so even still, I, I don't think, you know, I don't think there'd be much need for that unless it was just some ridiculously bad sounding reverb, which um, even then I'd, I'd then have to question, well, are you sure you want this reverb or do you want me to change it or whatever? Um, so there's always room for a discussion and there should be room for a discussion between mix engineer and client. For me personally, I always, and I'm, I hope any of my clients can vouch for this, I will always stipulate, uh, A, you don't pay until you're happy with the track. B, I will always keep that project on file for a few weeks after it's finished and the reason for that is because I know most of my clients are also DJs or live performers 
Um, so I do I do work for vocalists as well, for example. So they want to go out and perform their tracks. So I'll do, uh, you know, an a cappella version or, or, or a vocal version of a track. And then I'll also remove the vocals for them to be able to perform on top live. Um, you know, so a lot of my clients go to shows and perform in one way or another. And, you know, sometimes you'll you'll hear the mix and you'll think this is perfect. This is exactly what I wanted. And then you'll get to a gig and maybe when you're playing it up against another track or maybe because of its positioning in a set list or something like that, you might find, oh, I kind of feel like that kick drum's now a bit too much or something you might have loved a week before. So uh, you can always come back to me and go, actually, I've changed my mind on that kick drum. Can you just bring that down a dB or two or whatever it is, you know? Um, and that for me is just part of the service of being a mix engineer. You know, it's your track, it's your project. Um, you know, I want you to be happy as a client. Um, so yeah, so that's how I work. Um, yeah, I've probably waffled on way too long on that one. So yeah, basically, uh, what, ideal world, cutting it short, ideal world, I want to have stems from you when I drop them into my project. I basically hear exactly what you left it as um, with all the effects on. Obviously, don't put anything on the master channel. And this is one of the reasons why mix engineers say don't put any compression or anything on your master channel, because when you're sending me stems, there is nothing on the master channel when you bounce off a stem. So if you'd put on some crazy effects on the master channel, uh, I'm not going to hear that my end, so I won't know about it. Uh, could be a good thing, could be a bad thing. Thanks again for taking the time to do these AMAs. Much appreciated by me and I'm sure everyone. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, Rob Marconi, Manchester, high five. Uh, Distorts, Manchester, high five. How excited are you for the new Res album? Uh, Hex is such a good song, in my opinion. Uh, I didn't know she had a new album, if I'm honest. Um... Funnily enough, I was talking to someone the other day and they were asking me something about some new artist. And it, and I realised I don't listen to much dance music. That sounds really bad, but I kind of just don't get involved too much. Um, and I'll give you the reason why. The, the, the reason why is because if I'm in the car or sat at home listening to some music... Um, I tend to listen to anything but dance music because if I put on dance music, I'm going, oh, that kick drum isn't right. Oh, that, that bass line sounds good. Oh, how did they make that sound? And uh, I'm not really listening to the music or, or I'm listening too much then and I get distracted and I start putting my producer hat on. Um, so uh, usually when I'm listening to music, I listen to something like some reggae, some dub, some... Uh, classical, a bit of anything really, a bit of jazz, whatever. Uh, anything that's just something that I don't work in the field of uh, is better for me to listen to. Anyway, that wasn't your question. The Rez album, didn't know she had a new one, but that's cool that she's got another one already. Uh, as for how excited I am, um, as she's a great producer, so I totally understand other people being excited. Uh, I really like some of her tracks. I don't know if I like the style of music enough to warrant listening to an entire album myself, but that's totally subjective. Um, and if I'm honest, I could say the same about 90% of artists out there. Uh, so that's that. Uh, Scene McGoof, I'm still going to say that. Uh, I did read this comment, I think. Um, one big question I have is about rhythmic delays. Uh, I notice in most of your songs you have a certain rhythm in your delay pattern. Uh, the lower melody line during the breakdown of Borg, for example, yeah. Uh, and I was wondering if this is done with a standard ping pong delay or is there a plugin where you can edit the delay pattern other than 1 over 4, 1 over 8, etc. Also, by the way, this is the bit I read. My username is a deviation of my real name, Sean McGough, uh, that someone said once, so I just stuck with it. I'm still going to call you Seen McGoof, um, <laughs> because I prefer that. Um, so, uh, delays. In Borg, I think I probably used a default ping pong 
on a return channel and I would have also put some reverb in that same return channel and probably some side chain at the end of that chain in the return channel so that the main lead can cut through. Sometimes what I also do is I put that side chain against the kick drum like normal people but sometimes if it's in a return channel I'll sometimes give it some extended reverb and then side chain it against the original sound in the original channel. I have done a video on this on this Kane Audio channel so feel free to check it out. Um, I think I called it side chain the side chain something like that um, but yeah so I do sometimes do that. Uh, as for timings I think I usually probably more often use standard ping pong delays but I will have the left channel and right channel on different timings and I will usually avoid quarter note, eighth note, sixteenth notes so I will go for one over three, one over five, one over six tempos because I want them to be slightly off um, and I will also take off the synchronize so that they as they continue delaying they become more out of time um, because well because I like it if I'm honest um, however there are other tracks uh, like oh it hasn't come out yet um, so there's a track I've done for Mousetrap which should be out in the next month or so two months I think and in that I've used a delay which is to the millisecond so I haven't synced it to be quantized to any notes I've made it milliseconds but I used a calculator to work out the BPM was I'll say 124 BPM so I worked out well what is 1 16th of 124 BPM in milliseconds and I set it to default at that level but there are parts of the track where I then automate the time to swing out or swing in um, so it comes in and out of time but then again comes back to that 16th note so sometimes it's more fun to sort of play around with a, a, a free time uh, so yeah uh, Finn Fighter Manchester high five uh, Janice Lugbellis uh, Manchester high five Zombo, what subgenre of electronic dance music do you hate? Me personally, hardstyle. Uh, hate is a strong word. I don't like... I wouldn't say I don't like any one genre because I think the moment you say I don't like X, Y and Z genre you're missing an opportunity to maybe find some really good tracks so like you say you, you don't like hardstyle well there might be one or two hardstyle tracks that you do like um, however having said that I don't think I've ever heard an R&B and when I say R&B I don't mean rhythm and blues I mean modern R&B I don't think I've ever heard a R&B track that I even remotely liked um, I don't like auto-tune vocals when they're just slapped on. I don't like that broken rhythm with zero quantize. Um, I don't like sexualized lyrics. Not because I'm a prude, but because I just don't see the point. Um, I don't. I don't get. The lyrics self glamorizing I suppose in when it comes to the sexualization so singing about how I'm so sexy and all of that I just think ah oh, fuck off just you know leave your ego somewhere else um so I I, I kind of say R&B but maybe there's one or two tracks out there that I would love if I gave it a chance uh who knows other than that I quite like a bit of hard style every now and then I guess there's there's a time and a place for everything really. Um yeah, I don't think there's really anything I hate. Um 
I'm not really, I don't really understand the lo-fi house thing that I've heard about recently. I, someone sent me a few tracks as examples. And I was like, yeah, I don't know why you'd do that. Um, you know, if you, I can kind of th see that maybe they're heading for some sort of like Nathan Fake style, but Nathan Fake is not lo-fi. That's awesome. Uh, it just happens to be using some sort of lo-fi equipment to make it, but it doesn't sound lo-fi, so uh, I think that's probably about it. And then last question, uh, I, I'm not going to even attempt to spell that out, it's W exclamation mark RS, but I assume it's, it's Wurstikik77. Uh, hi, big question for you. Is it a good idea to work on an album if I am an amateur? Uh, that's a good question. So that's a really good question because it's hard to answer. Uh, OK, I'll put it this way. There's a couple of things to consider. First of all, is an album important in 2018? Record labels would probably say no. However, tour managers would probably say yes. Make of that what you want. Um, is it important to, is it a good idea to work on an album as an amateur? I can only speak from experience. I did what I called an album back in, must have been 2007, something like that. And if I listen back to it now, I regret releasing that. And I released it myself on my own label. Um, and there were a couple of good tracks in there um, that I can still listen to now and think, yeah, that was a cool track. I mean, it's different to what I do now, but for, for the date, for for when I did it, I'm, I'm fine with it. It's, it is what it is. But... If I was to ask myself, should I have released it as an entire album? Probably not, because looking back at it, it wasn't really telling a story. Which leads me on to my sort of final point about albums and whether you should do an album or not. I keep thinking about doing an album, but I feel like... In fact, I mentioned at the beginning of this video or somewhere in this video that I, I don't listen to dance music from start to finish in an album. Um, it's not it for me. It's not really listening music, not for me personally. So if I was going to make an album in dance music, I kind of feel like I would need a variation in BPMs. Um, you know, maybe touching on the Rez's album, I did hear her last album and it's, you know, I like that 8-bit thing. I like the, the, the BPM and that sort of slowed down EDM thing. Um, I think all of that's great. So all respect to her as a producer, there's, you know, I'm not taking anything away. But for me personally, I don't know if I could listen to an hour of it from start to finish all in one BPM um, because it's not, to me, it's not telling a story. Um, it might well be to her and that's great and to, and to her fans especially I'm sure it is and that's great um, so would I want to put out an album of just one BPM not really uh, I think I'd rather uh, at least have maybe if I had a 12 track album I'd like to maybe have at least three or four of those tracks to be maybe somewhat slowed down and ambient and maybe sort of you know, build in a story to, to the whole thing. Um, so, going back to the question, is it a good idea to work on an album if I'm an amateur? It's not bad. It's not a bad thing at all. Um, but you need to ask yourself, is it is it going to benefit you? Is it going to benefit you? Is it going to make you professional? Is it... Or do you need it to do any of those things? Are you doing it just for your own satisfaction? If you're doing it just for your own satisfaction, do it. That's a great idea. If you're going to enjoy doing it, then do it. Because that's why we got into making music in the first place, is because we enjoyed doing it. So, um, yeah, when it comes to an album, if you want to do it, go for it. Um, however, if your questions are 
along the lines of will it be a commercial success will it gain me more exposure will it get me more tour dates will it get me signed to a bigger label i would say for most of those unless you're already a big artist most of those will be answered with a no so uh, if those are your only reasons for doing it then i probably wouldn't bother um, for me personally when i first got signed to mousetrap i told myself the plan was release a few singles over the first couple of years and while i work on where i want to go then put together a couple of you know two three eps over the next year or two which i've now i'm in my first ep came out this year um so i'm at that stage now where i'm starting to go right well i've done one ep i now need to do another one or i, I want to do another one but i want to take it in a slightly different direction so that i'm not just this one trick pony which we all need to be careful of not being um and then once i've done the second ep maybe then i can start considering right now i've done this work and i've done this body of work and they're two slightly different directions so now i can broaden that now people have become accustomed to the fact that i don't just produce one track over and over again um although some people might argue with that um and then it's time to start looking at an album for me uh so I've probably waffled way too long. This camera for some reason today has cut out so many times. I have no idea how long this video is. So I apologize if it's too long, uh, but what are you gonna do? Nothing, exactly. Uh, so there we go. That is all the questions for this week's AMA. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, everyone who's made it this far into the video, uh, you deserve a gold medal. Um, because listening to me waffle for this long can't be too much fun. Uh, so since I'm looking at an old dodgy monitor, the keyword, if you've made it this far into the video, please comment with Dell. <laughs> and yeah, I think that is it for this week. So thanks again for listening. I will see you hopefully this time next week. Have a good weekend. Enjoy the sunshine if you're in the UK. It's just unbelievable uh the best sunshine we've had in years uh so have a good weekend stay safe and i'll see you next week cheers